Hi, and welcome to Drafting Compliance. I'm Kane, he's Tom, and we talked with Steve Gentry last time about planning for control changes. Today, we're talking about systems and communications protection. But before we get to that, we have some beers. What are we drinking today, Tom? Today, we are drinking something that I am, quite frankly, very excited to drink uh, because we have not had a stout yet. So today, we're drinking a stout. Uh, this is Correspondent Foreign Export Stout by Wander Brewing. And you'll see, uh, I, I read the side of the can, Kane, uh -huh. and this is from your backyard. Yeah, this is. This is from uh, Bellingham, Washington, from my friend uh, Cody, who actually recommended all of the Whatcom County beers. He's also the same guy who uh, recommended the raspberry one that was oh. just so horrifically terrible. <laughs> um, but I like I like the design on this. I'm not sure if it's coming through on the on, on the video here, but yeah, it's kind of an it's elegant, kind of an Art Deco yeah. look to it, really. I think it's cool looking. And uh, yeah, it looks this fantastic. is going to be, this should be unlike anything we've tried to this point. So I've never had this beer, so we're going to find out. But stouts are generally pretty thick. This particular one is 6.4% alcohol, and it's a 16-ounce can. So um, that should be a fun day for me. This is going to be like that day we did in Texas, Tom. Where, I don't where think it's going to be quite stage. that bad, but uh, no? All right. I'm going to crack right. this. Let's, oh, these sometimes, Let's see how this goes. Oh, Yeah, these oh, sometimes okay. have... A little nitro in them. This one does not. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's... Oh, this looks like, uh, what's that stuff called? The Coffee? Uh, uh, Guinness. Yeah, it's Guinness similar. is what it kind of looks like. Guinness is a stout. Yeah. This one has a surprising head it. on it. Oh, I can't so... fit it. I can't make oh, it Oh, gosh, fit. no. No, but no. look at how beautiful that is. Man, I, I'm enjoying it. You know, it kind of looks like a, at the top of it, it kind of looks like a, a latte if you make one with uh, oat milk. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, so it kind of looks this like should... that. It's very dark. You cannot see yeah. through it. There's like maybe a tiny caramel color to it. Yeah, this is this comes heavily oh. from from. <laughs> I just got foam in my nose. Oh, oh. I was gonna go sniff it. Congratulations! That's oh, right that is an experience. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> while you're recovering, I'll, I'll say stouts are are heavily roasted malt based. They're not particularly hoppy. So a lot of the the bitter hoppiness that we've had in like IPA should not be present with this. They're often a it's little got sweet. A strong coffee flavor in my nose right now is what I'm going to oh. go with. That's well, you I'm can gonna... certainly smell some of the coffee notes. You're certainly smelling the the roasted malt. I would not recommend inhaling this beer. I'm just going to give that as a pro tip. It is not. Uh, you're not supposed to in drink this through your nose. I also uh, I don't know if you'll smell this, but I smell some vanilla. And, uh, <sighs> A little chocolate. I mean, this is this is a bouquet for your nose, Kane. So uh, should, I just put my nose all the way into the foam, so I can I can clear that one with you, Tom. Yes, it is definitely a bouquet, but uh, <laughs> do not inhale it. Um, I do get a little bit of chocolate, um, yeah. and coffee. It's kind yeah, of what I've got going I think on that's here. That's accurate. Let's taste. We're, it. Are we going to try actually drinking it through our mouths as opposed to through, through our noses, Tom? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm. So definitely has that that um, coffee malt mix in the flavor. Well, I like it better definitely in my thick. mouth than in my nose, honestly. I'll, I'll say that right off the bat. It's way better as a non-inhalable beer. You know, it, it has none of the has none of the hoppiness that we've been drinking. So to no, me, it's, it a, it's almost a completely different. You know, it's still a beer, it's still a brewed beverage, but it it it, it could fall into a completely g different genus. <laughs> kind of, kind of reminds me of. Um, have you ever had a vegan chocolate cake? I uh, vegan. They kind of read. Yeah, ones, they kind of. Okay, okay. They kind of read like a chocolate tort, like really heavy, but also a little. Um, I don't know, kind of grainy. I guess. Yeah, that's kind of a, a strong grain flavor to them. And try another sip here, just to see if I'm uh, still on, but. Oh, okay. Well, every time. All right. Well, um, I'm going to ruminate on this one, and you're probably going to continue enjoying it, Tom. But in the meantime, <laughs> what is uh, systems and communications protection under FedRAM? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I would say maybe more than any other 
family of controls underneath FedRAMP. This one reads and feels like it's uh, you know just a catch-all family of controls. So you're going to get catch-all. a pretty wide variety. You know, it's like it's like the guys at at NIST said, well, we've got these you know 45 controls or whatever it is. We don't know where to put it, so let's just create some sort of vaguely named family of controls and throw all underneath there. So you're going to run the gamut of encryption, border protection, uh, DDoS protection. You're going to talk about um, you know network segmentation and how things communicate. I mean, it's just it's just a really kind of a catch-all. But I'm um, kind of I, hearing like an overall network theme there, right? Because everything you just mentioned is like networking related, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a very strong network um, undertone here, um, but you know there's also some encryption at rest, so um, right. you have to be you have to be um, prepared to see some things come out of out of the woodwork here with this this group. But certainly, when you think about um, all of the different families of controls that you have under FedRAMP, this one does feel a little different. All right. Well, let's let's get into some of the more detailed questions about it. So, um, how does system communications domain under FedRAMP moderate Rev five? How does it really align with our current threat landscape? Um, and I'm thinking particularly with the rise of sophisticated threat actors. Yeah, that that's an interesting question. I mean, certainly, much of this control family is talking about how do we protect our remote workforce, um, which mm-hmm. I think anybody um, living post pandemic in the information security world understands that the threat landscape in, in a remote world is different than it was in a centralized world. So, you know, you're dealing with things like how do you protect, um, company assets that are sitting on, you know, employees networks at home. Right. So mm-hmm. things like VPN and what, what does VPN really look like underneath a FedRAMP environment? Um, that's part of this control, but also DDoS has become a huge, um, threat in, you know, I think, I think the, the terabytes of data that now gets pushed with every major DDoS. Um, oh, like the new HTTP2 vulnerability. I think I got one too many T's in there. HTTP2 vulnerability. Uh, that is that covered under here? Well, certainly how you protect against it is covered okay. underneath here. And All right. Now I want to go back to VPNs as well, Tom, because you just you, you you're bringing up an interesting question. Because back in 2021 and 2022. We saw a lot of VPNs, like edge network components, getting shelled. So when you say it's got protections, is it about protections by using a VPN, or is it actually about protecting the VPN infrastructure? Well, there's a little bit of both here. Um, what I was speaking about directly was, you know, t- tunneling your company assets through it, an otherwise considered insecure network um, and what are those controls you have to put around. So for instance, you can't, uh, according to, I think it's SC7, um, you can't have a split tunnel, right? And still connect to right. the administrative interfaces and, um, you know, kind of it on the infrastructure on the backside. So um, there's safeguards around that. Um, it talks about the cri- cryptography levels that you have to leverage in transit and all mm-hmm. of that. So um, it's pretty encompassing. C- certainly it, it worries about whether or not um, you're still connecting from a, a trusted device. So a lot of principles that are kind of grouped underneath zero trust exist in this world too, or in this oh. family of controls. So um, again, you, yeah. you, you're not, you're not gonna trust that the device on the other end is. So, you know, there's, there's handoffs to other control families that moderate the, the end device itself, but um, this kind of puts a bubble around it. All right. Well, what would you say really are the um, the critical controls within this domain that organizations should prioritize, and and why those specific controls? Yeah, there's there is a bunch. So, you know, trying to prioritize them in a short segment would be difficult. But I I would say best practices are are present everywhere in this family of controls. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't worry as much about DDoS as I worry about how you manage your VPNs. I wouldn't worry as much about um, you know potentially the network um, boundary protections as I would about how you've segmented your network first. Um, you know, they, they're they going to call for proxy um, connections, which I think is always a good practice. But mm-hmm. would you prioritize that about above over your, your data at rest encryption level? Probably not. Um, so you have to think about all these holistically. It's really a checklist, Kane, if you think about it. Um, none of these controls are particularly difficult to implement. So yeah. I, if I were if I were sitting in the 
in the chair of uh, of another company, I would say let's let's create the checklist and just start going down them and saying which ones have we covered and which one haven't we, and then certainly prioritize the ones that are left. A bunch of these best practices are already going to be in place in many companies. No, that's a good thing. I mean, the reason I was trying to get away from a checklist-based implementation is uh, the way I always thought is threat actor engagement. So if you have visible, like if you're dealing with DDoSs, which they mostly just in, impose cost, they don't actually do like material harm to organizations, I'd say prioritize that control first and foremost in favor of implementing another control if you are seeing that level of threat actor engagement, just as an example. Certainly. I mean, I think every business has to look at what is their threat landscape and, and what are the things that they are most concerned about? I mean, the reality mm -hmm. is this, if you're implementing FedRAMP, you got to do them all anyway, right? Okay, so it's, it's, it's not true. like you can, yeah. it's, it's not, not like you not can, an elective. <laughs> yeah, it's not an elective. That's right. But, yeah. but certainly there are pieces of this that, um, your business are going to feel more acutely than others. Right. And I, to your point, I think that's important to understand. All right. And, and, so we getting away from that checklist mentality as far as we can, knowing we have to do all of these anyway. Uh, how do those controls within this domain really foster a culture of security and resilience against disruptions in communications and system operations? Yeah, it's very it's a very much a layered approach, which often uh, creates sort of the resiliency that you want in information security. Right. So it's defense in depth. So not only are you worried about your VPN, but you're worried about whether your VPN has an encryption level on it. Not only that, but is your VPN hitting a proxy service first before it's being dumped into the, the uh, inside of, and backside of your network? Do you have segmentation? So you're crossing segmentations with some rule set in place. Are you doing a deny all by default on your firewalls? So, you know, these are all layers that you build. Right. And those layers by, just by design, create the resiliency in, Certainly sort of the zero trust, which is a word that I don't normally like to use, but I've used it now twice in this. Mm -hmm. in this you have, but, and but CISOs the, watching this at this point are probably triggered by it because to them, that's usually a marketing term. And somebody's trying to sell them. Look, this router is a zero trust device. Yeah. Okay. How I think of zero trust is very much a layered approach, right? Where you're <laughs> doing some vetting at every level. That's what this, um, this program of controls really forces upon an organization, and it's a good best practice. That's fair. That's fair. And we're not going to make this a conversation about zero trust because otherwise we are going to we're going to rabbit hole on this. But that does bring into my next question, which is the evolution uh, and the continuous update of security standards. So so really, how should organizations approach the adoption of system and communications protection controls outlined in FedRAMP uh, modern R5? Yeah, certainly there's differences with uh, from R4 to R R5, although I don't think they're as significant here as they are in some other families of control. So you have to do that sort of gap analysis in, mm -hmm. and step up your game where it's appropriate. But in general, I think you're going to find, even if you're starting from scratch, you're going to find that there is nothing here that isn't a, a, a pretty standard best practice everywhere, and it has been for years and years and years. So... You know, where you might be in another control family, like the newest one, supply chain risk, where it's mm -hmm. created a level of diligence that nobody's used to having in place. Mm -hmm. We're used um, to documenting. To, right. You're going to have to rethink that family of controls. This one, I don't think there's going to be nearly that level of, of, of rethinking going on. I think it's going to be largely an approach that says, okay, you know, we do DDoS. Let's go review how we do DDoS. Is it still to the level that we can expect? And I can tell you organizations today that have implemented DDoS three and four years ago are mm -hmm. going to see a very different threat today than they saw three or four years ago. So it gives you a good chance to say, let's go reevaluate what we put in place and make sure it still meets our business objectives. You know, it used to be you, you signed up with a service and you had two or three gig worth of, of protection. That's no right. longer um, sufficient. It's not even close to sufficient. So you have to kind of review the, the current landscape. And I think, I think that industry is going to go towards more volumetric and, and less specific. Oh, definitely. Size. Yeah, that's where so. all the booter systems are going towards as well. That's but right. so far, everything you're saying, like, it sounds like this is mostly a solved space. And it, you say it's a lot of best practices, which to me means that systems administrators and IT administrators and network administrators probably have already seen these controls before. So what would you say are some common challenges organizations could encounter when they're actually implementing system and communication controls and, and how would they work to overcome those? Yeah, if you're in a legacy environment, uh, you're a large organization, you're, you're going to struggle with the encryption of data piece of this. 
-hmm. And it's not going to be because you don't understand encryption. It's going to be because you don't know where all your data sits. So mm -hmm. I've seen I've seen that time and time again, where you have to sort of peel the onion apart where it when it comes to data and you have to find all the little bits and pieces of data without the uh, within the organization and start to aggregate those polos in. Maybe you haven't done classification to know which kind of data you have. All mm -hmm. of that is sort of the pre work to, hey, now let's deploy encryption upon it. Right. You also might not have um, l legacy storage system that supports the the appropriate levels of encryption, AES 256 and whatnot. So. Right. That can be that can be a challenge. I can also tell you that network segmentation in legacy environments can be a challenge. So mm -hmm. you you really have uh, sort of a, a spread of of legacy devices that communicate maybe in very open uh, manners. Um, so you have to kind of rearchitect a bunch of that. Sometimes it means um, replacing some legacy systems. If you're a newer company like Hyperproof, you're going to have relatively greenfield builds. Um, yeah. A lot of this is going to be very easy to implement. Um, it's just a matter of kind of going through each each line item and, and thinking through, okay, do we have this c covered completely, partially, or not at all, and, and solving for it uh, with a readily available solution. So, you know, you can go out and find the solution to solve every one of these problems. That's not going to be an issue. Okay. And, and just to, I'm going back to your comments on zero trust. When you're saying network segmentation, you mean like, what, well, probably what you and I think of as old school network segmentation and not micro segmentation as is uh, recommended under a zero trust model, right? I, I would say this, the, the FedRAMP standard around network segmentation is fairly loose. I would say okay, your, yeah. Yeah. your business model is going to drive the depth of your, your network segmentation. Certainly they're going to have questions for you if you, um, if you haven't segmented off your administrative um, interface network from your, you know, your normal user. Yeah, interface. but the, you're saying that, that that's at a macro level or at a Correct. rough level, not at an individual port network address destination source with authentication well, based, which is what you'd see under zero trust. Yeah, you certainly have to drive down between your segmentation to allowed ports and services, and you have to have mm -hmm. a, a default deny all. So. The, the thought process is still the same. Um, you know, are we are we going to drive to every machine on its own segmentation? You know, that kind of thing. Not necessarily. In some cases, businesses should do that. But we are going to have significant segmentation in our network. And I think that's the best practice in understanding how communication occurs between those is a byproduct of that. That is very critical to FedRAMP. Fantastic. All right. And I'd say if you're enjoying this conversation on YouTube, ring the bell to get notifications about my quest to find any beer that I can actually drink. Or you can subscribe to this in your podcast app of choice to make this part of your monthly routine. Now, Tom, I had some questions about a couple specific controls I wanted to drill in on. And sure. one of them was um, SC5, which is denial of service protection, because we've been talking about DDLSs and DOSs for a while now on, on the show. Um, how can organizations better prepare for and mitigate the risks associated with denial of service attacks? And what role does, that, does this control really play in such preparations? Yeah, the first thing I'd say is for the most companies in the world, you're not going to solve this problem by yourself. You're, you're not going to bring in the pipes of size and diversity required to solve this. Even when I had um, responsibility at a data center company with, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, multiple 10 gig pipes to multiple data centers to the internet. Um, we couldn't solve this problem on our own, right? So you're going to go talk to a provider who has the edge capability to solve this problem. And you're really going to want to do your research to understand the scope of that problem and buy accordingly. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not a normal um, target for DDoS, you know, if you're not providing services out on the internet, um, mm -hmm. this is probably going to be a, a a family of controls that you can sort of take the low road on. But if right. you're like Hyperproof and you have a significant presence on the internet and your entire service is provided through the internet, you're going to want to have a much higher um, level of diligence around your DDoS. So you're going to go out and you're going to talk to your provider and you're going to say, what are you providing at the edge? How many places? How What's the size of the capability? But more mm -hmm. importantly, how am I going to get, how am I going to get um, build if there's a DDoS. Knowing that up front and not getting build a, a base based upon a load that you can't predict right. is to me is an important factor. 
So you need to negotiate. Yeah, I love that you've got a cost factor in there because I, I think that is where organizations often miss the they, they miss a trick when they first deal with DDoS providers and yep, well, I agree. compensating controls. Well, also, we've talked about boundary protections and micro segmentation, macro segmentation. Let's talk about control SC7. Um, how do organizations really ensure effective boundary protection in a world where the traditional network perimeter just it's vanishing? And how does this control actually guide those efforts? Yeah, there's a lot in here. We've talked about some of it, right? I mean, there's definitely a recognition by FedRAMP with, with SC7 that the, the network is pushed out and is now dispersed. So mm -hmm. They want you to first understand all of your endpoints and, and, and make sure that you have network identification occurring on those endpoints. So it's mm -hmm. not as if anything should be able to connect to your back end. They're going to want to make sure that you understand that the Internet is in an insecure means of, of communication, open to man in the middle and all the other things. Right. So, um, you know, how you tunnel and, and how you create a VPN um, is critical to them. Making sure you don't split tunnel, for instance, and have your internet mm -hmm. um, still be a local connection. Um, that's all governed underneath this this group of controls. So there certainly is a nod by uh, the folks at NIST and by you know by proxy at FedRAMP um, that that recognize that the boundary is not what it used to be. They still have controls in here, as if you have a boundary that is is local, right? I mean, they want to make sure you're mm -hmm. jumping through proxy. They want to make sure you have network segmentation. All of those things are applicable whether you're remote or not. But but certainly there's a family of, con of concerns here that are all about being remote. But it sounds like ultimately if, if an organization has an enclave style environment, that's broad scope network segmentation. And if you VPN into that network um, and don't allow for split tunneling, that would allow remote staff to actually get into administrative controls still following these control frameworks, right? Yeah, that's correct. You know, there's okay. you start to pull in other families of controls when you start talking about this, but you know, so how you handle your your endpoint in general has to be considered, but that's another family of controls. I, I think we've already talked about that one, didn't we? We have. I think we did. We'll probably drop a link in the show notes for that one as well. But I'm also just noticing the time, Tom. We should probably get to our uh, get to our beer reviews for this now. Um, I think you've had a bit more than I have. Yeah, um, my, I'm going to have um, another final sip and see what it's like. What about you? Of course, I always have. A, I I will finish mine completely, Kane. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about my final sip. Oh, now it's like coffee that's been left out for too long. Mm. And I don't it like coffee, but I like well. this. It has not sat well. Like some of these, the, the flavor changes over time. Like this is nowhere, I'll say this, it is nowhere near as offensive as some of the things that we've drank on the show. Um, having said that, actually it's got, you know, it's definitely, you know, burned coffee. Yeah, burned coffee. It's like, oh, um, Starbucks. That's what this is reminding me of. It's like Starbucks... One of their roasts just tastes like they burned it, and that's kind of the vibe this has got, minus sugar and left out for about a day cold. Oh, uh, that's not sounding appealing, is it? So I'm going to give this a, uh, I'm going to give it a three. I'm between a three and a four, but I'm going to give it a three, I think, just because that, it did I not I feel like you talked yourself into a well. lower rating on this, because you start off as this isn't nearly as offensive as much much of the things that you yeah but then to. i got the aftertaste and it started yeah. coming like it, it's it lingers <laughs> on i feel like i want breath mints after this as well as to go blow my nose honestly well, i'll say this um today is a perfect day in iowa for a stout it's 40 something degrees it's rainy um you know you want Beautiful. to you you are definitely considering kicking on your fireplace uh tonight uh, which i probably will do and this is a perfect beer to drink in that sort of an environment. So I've actually been enjoying it. I can look outside and I can see the dreariness and I can take a sip of this. And um, all the things you said, I mean, it, it's got the coffee flavor. It's, it's um, a heavier drink. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you're drinking IPAs, like I normally do and you switch to a stout, you'll notice that difference between them. But in terms of stout, this is really good. I will tell you, Kane, stouts come in all kinds of of flavors so you can get like a oatmeal stout you can get a oreo stout which will taste like oreo cookies and you know so there's sorry a peanut, an oreo stout yeah you can get a peanut butter stout which will which will have a, a big peanut flavor in it so stouts are very this is just a straight up stout it kind of in the 
in the model of Guinness. It's very good. Um, so if I'm drinking stout, I would give this a six. This is really good. Six. Okay, fantastic. Well, I gave it a three. You gave it a six. And with that, I think we're out. So if you've enjoyed today's show, uh, please do remember to like and subscribe. And for that, that's everything for today. Great seeing everyone. Thanks so much for being on the show, Tom. Thank you.